as we go through life, there is one thing that all of us try so hard to avoid, the inevitable fear. But there are those of us who seek only fear, like those of you who clicked on this video tonight. For that, I thank you, but by the end, you may not thank me. So lock your doors, bar your windows, turn up the lights, and prepare, prepare for Night Shift by The Shadow. Now relax, this won't hurt too much. <laughs> I have worked overnight security at this lumber yard for uh, longer than I care to remember. It all started when I dropped out of high school at the mere age of 16 and decided to see the world. The world, in this case, being the thick forest surrounding where I grew up and still live today. I was raised by my mother, a well-meaning alcoholic with good intentions. The problem here was that her good intentions were warped by many unpleasant childhood experiences, causing her to raise me in a very sheltered manner. I'll never forget that first time I entered the forest. I was on my own, a teen with nothing better to do than wander, which led to, you guessed it, I got lost. I was in the forest for one whole week before I emerged at the same place where I started from. I was forever changed by that week from then on. After a brief recovery, I decided to brave the forest once again two days later, this time bringing supplies and enough, and enough provisions to last for the duration. I set out with the intent to learn every square inch of this forest, a task that turned out to be remarkably easy, considering my immense lack of any knowledge concerning calligraphy and whatnot. On the third day of my excursion, I emerged in a clearing where a cabin stood. My curiosity was piqued by this discovery, and without a moment's hesitation, I decided to check it out. The door hung from one hinge, swaying back and forth in the light breeze that began shortly before I entered the clearing. I entered the cabin and was met with a sight that gave me the feeling of coming home. There was an armchair seated in front of a fireplace. A sight that filled my mind with visions of cold winter nights spent in front of a roaring fire with a good book. I knew right then and there that I would live there someday, whatever it took. Removing my, nap from, removing my map from my knapsack, I noted the exact location of the cabin and with a spring in my step, turned and exited the cabin to head back for civilization, a list of things to do to make the cabin more livable already forming in my head. It took two more days of walking, following the route I took in days previous to reach civilization. Once I arrived, I made my way home and promptly fell asleep, intent on completing my tasks regarding the cabin in the morning. I woke up and showered and was out the door by 8. It didn't, long to, uh, it didn't take long to find a willing driver to City Hall, which in and of itself was quite remarkable, as usually it took hours waiting along the highway thumb stuck out, only to have car after car drive past without so much as a glance in my direction. Upon arriving at City Hall, I went to the reception desk and re requested information on that mysterious cabin. After about 20 minutes, of, 20 minutes of searching, there was no further information to be had about the cabin, so it was marked as a, as a new location, with the land title being signed to me, something that filled me with elation. Finally, something to call my own. Upon leaving City Hall, I walked across the road to where a payphone stood. Depositing a quarter and dialing the number, I stood with my fingers crossed that my mother would be able to drive me back home. On the seventh ring, she answered, sounding, sounding remarkably sober for once. She agreed to pick me up, and arrived no more than ten minutes after ending the call. Sitting across the kitchen table from each other, the horror in my mother's eyes became apparent upon learning of my plan. She didn't object, however, which was very good for my cause. The rest of the day was spent in silence at home, preparing, with the exception of driving back to town to pick up some supplies to make the initial repairs to the cabin. One month later, I was in complete and utter paradise. The cabin was just perfect for me. As it turned out, walking just over a mile from the clearing, there was a walking trail that led to town. In the month that I spent at the cabin, I had no contact with my mother, and that was just fine with me. The peace that accompanied my solitude was interrupted within the next week with loggers working nearby. I was awoken to the sounds of work, and went to confront the source. It turned out that a local logging company had been granted a permit to clear out part of my land. That same day, I decided to speak th with the supervisor of the site. After some initial small talk, the conversation shifted to me and my cabin. 
It was then that the supervisor asked me if I wanted to work for his company. I told him that I had no experience, and then he outlined the job offer further. Security de detail was needed on site, and I seemed the perfect candidate due to my proximity to the work site. There would be little paperwork required, and the payments would be under the table, which cinched the deal. The supervisor called his boss, who showed up approximately 20 minutes later. I invited them into my cabin to sign some forms, and with that, I began my exciting new career in night security. After a while of working for this company, I was able to afford to make some important changes to my little cabin. For a small fee, I was able to have power and telephone hooked up, and was able to buy a small 4x4, cash sale of course. That night, after dinner, but before my shift, I called my mother. She was so happy to hear from me, and insisted on meeting up. I let her know that I had worked shortly, but offered that she could come out and meet me at my new cabin. After giving her the directions, we ended the call and I radioed the fellow at the entrance of the logging road and told him to let my mother pass through when she arrived. She arrived a while later and was out of the car, running towards me with out ar outstretched arms before the car had even stopped. The hug lasted for what seemed like hours, and then we entered my home. After a brief tour, we sat at the table. The vibe suddenly changed to that of an Eve, and following that, my mother took my hand and said, We need to come home. I looked her in the eyes, pulling my hand away from hers as I replied with a staunch no. She looked hurt at this, and that didn't even change after explaining the reason for my refusal, being that this is where I now worked, and that I own the property, and etc. After a short pause, she then explained her reasons for wanting me home which turned out to have nothing to do with wanting me home, but for more sinister reasons. My mother reached down and picked up her purse, from which she produced this flask of some sort of booze and a small leather-bound book. She then proceeded to tell me of her experiences growing up around those woods, including what exactly happened to make her the way she was today. She opened the book, and there was a picture of the very cabin where I now resided. The picture was slightly torn around the edges, indicating its age. She explained her history in connection to the cabin, and now in a state of drunkenness, proceeded to tell me of the legend surrounding this forest and the cabin. This was the point in where I ceased to listen to her. She got so stupid and weird when she would tell stories when she was drunk. I learned long ago that most of the stuff she talked about was just gibberish and nothing more. When she finished whatever she was rambling about, she drained the last of the liquor from the flask and lay her head in her hands and wept. A few moments later, she stood up without a word, grabbed her purse and stumbled out the door to her car. That was the last time I saw my mother alive. I was informed the next day that my mother had been found beside the road, apparently having hung herself. The car sat in the breakdown lane, four-way flashes on, and perhaps ten yards away, she had climbed a tree, tied a rope around a sturdy branch, tied the other end around her neck, and jumped. I shed no tears upon learning this. I rationalized that she had done this purely to stop the pain and to get back at me. For weeks, life continued as normal for me, until one night, I happened to notice a leather-bound book under the floor, uh, on the floor under my table, and the events of that night came back with complete clarity upon opening the book and flipping through each page. The disbelief of my mother's drunken rambling decreased slightly after reading a newspaper article taped to one of the pages. All the details matched up with my mother's story. I felt a chill ran down my spine as the realization hit me of the magnitude of this situation. In a state of shock, I folded the article back up and turned the page, where my mother's neat ha handwriting stuck out like a sore thumb. The legend of the forest and the cabin went something like this, according to my mother. Thirty or so, thirty or so years before my mother was born, a woman and her son went missing, having last been seen in this forest. Twenty years later, the, dif the disappearance remained. Ten years after, a young man enters the town's hardware, hardware store and purchases some bu building supplies and a shovel. He pays and isn't seen in town again until about a month later when he is seen with an infant girl in the local grocery store. After that time, the man is seen once a week, always with the girl, each time growing bigger and bigger. Fifteen years after that, the man, and what is presumed to be his daughter, move into a house just outside of town, where they remain for a few months, and then suddenly vanish. Add a week, and suddenly a young girl is found, bloody and, and unconscious, at the side of the road. A passing motorist stops and takes her to the hospital, 
where she is discovered to have many severe injuries and is also found to be pregnant. When the girl finally regains consciousness, she, rema she remains silent. She eventually gives birth to a baby boy, and when he is presented for the girl to hold in her arms, she breaks down sobbing and screaming. The nurses restrain her and sedate her, and a psychiatrist is brought in to do a mental evaluation. Following the interview, the local police are contacted. It turns out that the father of the child was the girl's father, and in an act of self-defense, she killed him when he began to beat her brutally, trying to cause a breach that would abort the pregnancy. She fought hard, and after she had killed him, she managed to drag herself to the roadside where she was later found. This is the point where things get really weird. It turns out that the girl's mother was the man's mother. He had murdered her after raping her months previous, and she gave birth to a daughter, the girl. How does the cabin come into all this, you ask? Well, for decades previous, similar happenings went on, usually with a mother and young son going missing in the woods, yada yada yada, and coming across the cabin for shelter. Some say that the clearing and cabin are cursed, and I've heard all the stories over the years. How do I come into all of this? After reading through the book, I decided on a hunch to investigate further. A trip to the Hall of Records confirmed my suspicions. The girl in the legend was my mother. My mother. Over the years of my employment with the logging company, I saw many strange go on in this forest, but I won't outline them here, as they add little to what I'm telling you. What is important to know here is that you realize the scope of what I'm telling you. Over the years, things have changed immensely in the world, yet the clearing and the cabin have remained the same. No one truly knows who originally built the cabin, or when it was built, but the purpose seems evident in some sick and incestuous ritual. The clearing seems to have some sort of supernatural power that is strongest when no one occupies the cabin, so in order to break the cycle, or at least keep it at bay for as long as possible, I'll continue to live here and work night security. As for the things I've seen over the years, that's for another story. Hold on. I just heard a knock at my door. The woman and her son have been missing for the past week. I saw it on the news. Perhaps I was wrong about everything about the draw of the clearing. With this new revelation, now there is no clear thing to do. I think the best course of action is to find a way to... The book felt heavy in my knapsack as I made my way through the trees but the weight was forgotten as I emerged in the clearing where a cabin stood, door hanging from one hinge, swaying slightly in the breeze that sprung up about thirty minutes ago. I mustered the strength to walk to the door, and the smell emanating from within caused me to hesitate. There was a smear of what appeared to be blood across the door, and a trail of which led inside. Looking up at the sky upon the breeze increasing in strength, I saw the dark clouds, dark clouds almost upon me, coming from nowhere. I took my son by the hand and entered the cabin, the need of shelter from the approaching storm outweighing the sense of dread brought on by the, the blood. A man sat in an old armchair facing a fireplace, covered in blood and clearly dead. My face a mask of horror, I turned and saw a young girl, perhaps thirteen or so, lying on the floor, a baby clutched to her breast. Both were barely breathing, and I initially thought them to be both dead but the baby suddenly squirmed and let out a hoarse cry, and the young girl moaned softly, her eyes not opening. A tear rolled down my cheek as I saw my son collapse to the floor in exhaustion. I removed my knapsack from my back and to search for the last water bottle in hopes to at least ease some of my son's suffering. I opened the pack to find the water bottle and... the book. I gave the bottle to my son and slowly opened the book. After flipping past various pages and a newspaper clipping, I saw neat handwriting. Reading, my eyes widened. The legend goes as follows.